Hey guys, okay, we're watching a new video today that was just uploaded by Shadowversity. Or actually, well, when I upload this reaction, it won't be uploaded today. Uh, it is September 2nd, and that is when Shad uploaded this video. Um, anyways, this is <laughs> the purpose of mortar in castles. So, for those that are new, I am a... I guess I'd probably say I am more of a political historian. And also, well, the time period in which I am studying is late 800s England, specifically Wessex, uh, during the Viking invasion under Alfred the Great. So, the castles that would be around at this time were largely wooden, if not, I think the large majority, if not all, in England at this time would have been wooden castles, really. So, you know, I don't know this topic all too well, aside from previous ep uh, videos I've watched of Shadowversity in the past. So let's go ahead and learn what the heck mortar was used for castle was used for in castles. Shadowversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and I want to talk. Such a good-looking brigandine. Let's be like, hmm. Oh, that 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 like color, the the like slightly darker red. Oh, so. Mm. Talk to you a little bit about mortar used in medieval castles. Now, as dry a topic as you might assume that is, it's actually very, very interesting because there is some misconceptions, misunderstandings about medieval mortar, which I have even been under in the past. I think I mentioned in my video how castles were built. And so, uh, you know, if you were actually reaching out to me saying, ah, uh, Shad, actually, you should have a look at this because this is how medieval mortar probably worked. And after getting that email, I looked into it further, found some really interesting things about it because the idea that mortar functioned like a type of glue holding the stones together is actually incorrect. Now it's true after about a thousand years or so just sitting there and just solidifying under pressure and other things like that the uh, ruins that we see the mortar is rock solid. Yes. But the mortar actually when I was originally applied. Okay so <clears throat> I do know a little bit on this but that's basic it's kind of more basic architecture. Um, so uh, I don't know the true I think mortar helped them, I guess, stay together or something, or maybe it emphasized the holdings between them or something. But really, it's not the mortar that truly holds them together, it's the pressure of the other bricks and stones that hold everything together. So, like, if you look at an archway, this center piece right up here where my cursor is, that piece right there is the sole reason that the rest of this arch is standing, right? Like if you were to just like, it, it's that top piece there that really holds it all together. Um, and so obviously laying brick upon brick, obviously you take out the bottom brick, you kind of can crumple the whole thing or something. But I, and I think that's might be why the mortar is there um to help hold it up or something anyways let's let's continue on and see what chad's research has brought forth wide to medieval castles wasn't like that at all in fact the strength of medieval mortar for many years after its first application is more akin to plaster than that of stone the reason being the recipe for medieval plaster is actually the same as the recipe for medieval mortar although really? the quantities of each ingredient could vary so the mortar, you know, medieval mortar, is made out of a combination of quicklime, sand... And I think it's important, especially what he's saying, he's making the emphasis, medieval mortar, right? Because over time, things do change. Uh, 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 what we use to make certain things change over time. Like the cobble paths or the roads that the Romans laid. Those aren't the same kind of roads that we lay, right? It's evolved over time. Now, obviously, 
It can be argued that the Roman, the pass that the Romans made was were probably superior to the pass that we make today because, well, the Roman paths are largely still there while our roads have to be fixed every, like, few years, right? Um, but I'm no architect. I'm not a, you know, so I, those aren't, that kind of study isn't my, my field of, my field. So I'm not going to go too deep into it, just like a little side note. And, and water. That's it. Specifically, the quick lime was added with water, creating slack lime, and that was the thing added in the mixture. It mixes together, and that's how you use it. Now, it does dry to a certain extent, but to say it becomes as hard as rock, like concrete or modern-day mortar, it's not the case. So it raises the question, why was it used, and what function did it serve? That's exactly what I'm going to be talking about in this video. Castles in the most basic form are stones stacked on top of one another. Now, there's a lot more complexity and sophistication to it than that. Balanced load-bearing points, arches for windows and doors, how to uh, fix the roof and floors to the building, incorporating stairs and other things like that. So, look, there's a lot more to it. But in its most basic state, we really, if we just dumb it down, it's stacking stones one atop another. And in some of the... As I was saying earlier. The earliest cases of castle-like structures... That's how it's kind of done. If you have a look at the Scottish brochs, is it brochs? I'll put the name there. But these are really intriguing castle-like structures, not made with any mortar at all. Just stones stacked very carefully one atop another. And indeed, if we have a look at some of the stone foundations of Japanese castles, no mortar either. Just very carefully positioned stones. So if it can be done that way, why use mortar at all? Well, there are inherent issues with that method, and it's about the points of contact. Yes. Now, I have two stones before me here, and so if I was to flip this one, oh, gee, it's heavy. Oh, gosh. <laughs> On top of this, okay? Okay, so it seems. Okay, so my initial guesses were kind of right, right? There. You, f you put them, you do stack them on top of each other, but there are still gaps. Because obviously, unless you carve out the rock, they're not going to fit together perfectly. Even if you carve out, there's probably going to still be gaps, right? So, you know, mortar fills in those holes. Seems stable enough, but, oh, do you see this? Do you see that there is not perfect, okay? Now, if we had another stone here and another stone here, yeah, especially some behind, it could do the job. But the thing that I just showed, this right here is an issue. Now, what we're finding is that the stone is actually resting on probably three points of solid contact with the fourth contact, you know, not there, which is why we get the rocking motion. Now, to fix this, you would put a smaller stone underneath, stabilizing it, but that would still only create four points of contact holding that stone up and all the weight atop it. And this can be even worse if the stone wasn't as flat on the underside which is actually what we see on the top. So let's flip this over and see what happens here. Do you see this? This is actually, ooh, it's not good at all, all right? Now, unless stones are perfectly flat, all right, this is gonna cause some issues that I'll explain in just a moment. The smoothest, most carefully, you know, chiseled stones are gonna be the ones that go around the frames, the arches, okay, so the frames of windows, the archways, the main supports of vaulted ceilings and corbels and spans for doorways and things like that. But if they spent so much time on every single stone of the castle, that would just increase the time and work. Yes, 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 yes. Workload. Yes. To crazy amounts. I'm not saying it was never done. But generally, when they free the stone from the, its larger origin, okay, where it comes from, they're only going to shape it somewhat. In actual fact, they're going to find the best position in which to place it. But even if you find a good position that it fits nicely, it's not going to be a perfect fit. And there will be irregular points of contact. So right here, okay, there's only two points of contact. Now, this is a problem because there's a lot of weight that's going to be put on top of it. And with a hundred, 
1,000 tonne pressing down on these smaller points of contact, well, that focuses all that pressure to very small areas, increasing the likelihood that this stone might actually break. And if the stone breaks, that could be devastating, like really serious, especially if there's a lot of stones above. And say part of this stone falls forward in the break, that could destabilize every single thing above, and it could actually cause like a whole side of a tower or castle to collapse. You don't want that. So how can you fix? What do you mean I don't want that? You don't know me. Maybe I want a giant hole in the side of my tower, huh? <laughs> The problem of irregular points of contact with unfitted stones or imperfectly fitted stones. You might be understanding where I'm going here. This is the purpose of mortar. Now, what I've added here is actually a sandy kind of dirt. It's actually not a perfect equivalent to medieval mortar, which will be more slushy and, and is viscous is the term, but it should be accurate enough to approximate and demonstrate the point I'm sharing here. So with this poor, you know, excuse of mortar, <laughs> watch what happens when I place the stone atop of it, okay? There is no rocking at all. Now, that's actually worked remarkably well. <laughs> I love how he's surprised by it. Uh, I like that. The weight is now distributed perfectly even on the stone beneath through the mortar or sand I'm using here, which creates a uniform point of contact, okay? Because the stone can bury itself into the mortar or sand. It shapes itself to the underside of the stone and supports every point evenly. So there's no concentration of weight on a specific point of contact. Because if you had a look at the stones resting atop one another without the mortar, there was a lot of gaps in air in between because only resting on two points, which is like a terrible situation. But with now mortar in between, look at how solid this is. It's not rocking. This is actually really, really stable. And so with this method, you can then build up and up and up and the weight will be distributed very evenly from stone to stone all the way into the foundations. So it's not that mortar acts like a glue, it's that mortar serves a very functional purpose in helping distribute the weight evenly through the stones into the ground, creating a far more stable structure. And like I said, there is a level of adhesion that helps, but it's not like glue, okay? The important point to remember. So this is actually, it just goes to show you how the ingenuity that went into these amazing medieval structures in just one point amongst the many. It helps me appreciate the genius of these beautiful structures, not only structures, really any structure of the medieval period and even earlier that used this type of basic, or well, not this exact type, the substitute that I'm holding, of medieval mortar, which is just simply quicklime, sand, and water mixed together. So there we go. Look, I find it really interesting. I wanted to share with you. I hope you have enjoyed. Maybe you've found it interesting. And of course, I hope to see you in the next video here on Shadowversity. So until that time, farewell. Ooh, all right. I learned some, you know, it's it's obviously something that you could probably assume right you know like once you hear the explanation it's like oh it's obvious yeah right you know that it, it's something that's obvious but you don't realize you know it yeah it's one of those things right and, and i really like that this this kind of explanation short video uh covered what it needed it, it covered what it did it what it covered, he handled it wonderfully well. I can't speak. Gosh. Whew. Um, yeah. Uh, I love Shad. Great channel. Um, definitely someone you want to watch if you want to learn more about castles, right? Uh, and all their ins and outs. Um, so yeah. I think that's going to do it for the... I don't know what else to comment on. Because, well... He did a great job explaining the purpose of mortar in castles, per the title of the video. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's gonna that's gonna do it for today. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. Thank you.